Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. So let me ask you a very interesting question that back in 2016, what was your mobile phone bill? The answer would be close to zero because Reliance Jio had recently launched and all of us were enjoying that freebie that we were getting from Reliance. But over the years, Reliance started hiking its price and tariff plans. And just last year, they have increased their tariff by 21%. So now quote me what your mobile monthly bill is. It would be a lot. Now, my prediction is that going forward, people like you and I are going to pay crazy amount of money in terms of the fuel charges, in terms of logistics or transportation, in terms of electricity bill, in terms of flight payments. Now, why is that happening? It is happening because of Russia's model. Now, what Russia has to do with it? So for that, you need to understand the backstory. And there is a very important macroeconomic concept that I will tell you as to how monopoly businesses distort the living standards for middle class people and lower middle class people. So to kickstart that story, try answering this question. Who do you think is the richest person on earth? Some would say Elon Musk, some would say Bill Gates, some would say Warren Buffett. All are wrong answers. The richest person on earth is Mr. Vladimir Putin. His estimated unofficial net worth is somewhere around $200 billion. Now that is not even the interesting part. Now the interesting part is that if you pick the apex politician in Russia, he or she would hold this title of being the richest person on earth, unofficially speaking. Now comes the natural question that, okay, why is it the case? So to cut the long story short, back in 1991, when the disintegration of USSR took place and Russia was formed, a lot of government-oriented businesses were converted into private players or private organizations. And a lot of businesses were given to these big private players. But unofficially, the politicians controlled the wealth of these private players. And therefore, we are sitting in a world today in Russia where eight out of 10 of their top businesses lie in the infrastructure or oil and gas domain. Here is the complete list. You can go and check it out. Now, something very, very similar is happening in India and people are cheering for it. Now, I know a lot of people would have disliked this video already because you know what, Akshat, you are trying to give it a political color. You run a finance channel. Why are you speaking about politics? Okay, so let me make my stand explicitly clear. This entire nexus of business politician has been run by a series of political parties. I'm not pointing this to one specific political party. This has been done time and time and time again by a series of different political parties. So if you can look beyond politics, apply a little bit of rational thinking, you will understand what is happening. And I really urge you that please kindly consider supporting these type of videos. It will help people think rationally. I'm not trying to impose my viewpoint. I will just explain you the entire story. You pick up whatever you want to pick up out of this, but please form an opinion. If you like it, please like the video. If you dislike it, I and mean, if you think that I'm being biased, dislike this video but pick a side so let's kick start the video and we are going to discuss the topic of responsible monopolies and irresponsible monopolies and what exactly are monopoly oriented businesses do we need them do we not need them and how as a common citizen you should think about this entire spectrum and viewpoint you will understand a lot of economics finance behind whatever i am speaking these type of videos require a lot of research so if you do like the content do consider sharing so okay so let us have a very quick conversation as to what is meant by monopoly business businesses by understanding two central terms. So the first key thing is that any monopoly business, for example, if you take a look at the airports in India, there are only going to be limited number of airports once our entire infrastructure is built. Now, if one company controls most of that airport, it would be called as a very big company in that space. And one could argue that it has become a monopoly in that particular industry. Now, such companies have created a very big barrier to entry. Barrier to entry means that, for example, let's imagine that there are only 300 airports in India that can eventually be built. And one of these companies control 200 such airports. Now, can other people come and create another airport in Delhi? It is very, very unlikely because Delhi at max might have two airports or maybe three airports eventually in the next 50, 60 years. So from that perspective, very high barriers to entry have been created and no new competition can come. So now comes the natural question that you know what? Does it mean that we should not give private players an opportunity to become these type of monopolies? Or is it okay for government to hand over this type of work to certain private players? Now, this becomes a highly debatable issue. Sometimes it takes a nationalistic color. For example, I get so much heat that you know what, you're speaking against Adani ji, he's doing like such great work. Yes, yes, he's doing amazing work. I completely respect it. But please understand that I'm speaking from an economics viewpoint. Consider in this simple example that out of 300 airports, hypothetically, if 200 are controlled by Adani ji, then what is going to happen to you? 
you and I as common citizen, then it is very, very likely that like the Reliance Geo story that they are now jacking up the prices for everything because there are hardly two, three players left in the telecom space. Similarly, if one company controls 200 airports, you will pay more money for the burgers that you eat or the book that you buy or the taxes that you pay for taking your flights, the parking space that you procure, etc, etc. Now, you might have a natural response that if they increase the flight ticket prices, then I'll stop using the airlines altogether. Well, very good. Now, can you travel from Kashmir to Kanyakumari in bus? Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but it will take a lot of time. And for a lot of people, taking a bus or a car is not feasible at all. This is a highly important product that will be used by people and it will not have a very high elasticity of demand. So I hope that you got the perspective and there is no clear line whether the government should outsource these monopoly oriented businesses to the private sector or not, but there has to be a certain oversight. And you tell me whether this is being done in a responsible way. Again, not targeting any particular party. This has been done by a bunch of different political parties. So I will just leave that conversation there. So now comes the second point that even if you assume that, you know what, government cannot be everywhere. It cannot manage like ports. It cannot run like power companies. It cannot do like 500 different things. It has to bring in private players. So then there is a difference between creating responsible monopolies and irresponsible monopolies. Now, this is a tweet that I had done and I will name the groups directly. So I compared the Tata group with Adani group and look at the hate that I got. I just simply presented facts. And the fact was that it will take 16.4 years for Adani's to repay their debt. And it will only take 1.5 years for the Tata group to repay their debt. Now you'll say that, okay, how did you get this number? Can you show some math behind it? Absolutely. Here is the math behind it. And this is called as cash flow to debt ratio. And you can see that for the Adani group and these numbers are from September. So now the situation will be even more worse. So the total group was 936.6 and here it was 1216.6 billion rupees. So if you take a look at their free cash flow, so free cash flow simply means ki company ke kitna paisa aa hai, right? I mean, how much money they are eventually getting. So from that simple perspective, if you do this entire entire analysis, you get this repayment time. So that is how you reach a number that if you compare it to the Tata group, they are also creating certain monopolies in certain industries. For example, Tata Salt could be considered as a monopoly. Similarly, they control a lot of power business, etc, etc. But the point is that the Tata group has grown sensibly and organically or to a very large extent organically. There has not been a dramatic rise by taking on public debt. So I will speak about this point subsequently, but I hope you got this number where I got that from and you tell me whether this is a worrying situation or not. Please be a little bit rational. I'm not trying to sway you from one way to the other. I'm simply trying to bring forth the viewpoint. What is the difference between a responsible monopoly creation vis-a-vis -vis an irresponsible monopoly creation? So let's move on and let's try to take a look as to what the hidden incentives are. For example, if the Tata group ends up becoming a big monopoly, who is it that eventually benefits? Vis-a-vis, -vis, let's do the same comparison for Adani Group. So here is the entire roadmap of the Tata Empire and they own all these different companies. And just for context, 66% of this entire space is owned by a company called as Tata Sons, right? Tata Sons. Now, what is the Tata Sun? Tata Sons is run by two different trusts and they donate a large chunk or a major chunk of that money to different philanthropies. So if the Tata group becomes big, most of that money would be donated in form of charities. Now, would similar be the case in Adani groups? So who owns the Adani group? So again, here is the snippet and you can see that it is owned and operated by the Adani family. So here is the entire roadmap and I will present some finance around it so that this concept sticks. So there are four specific points that you need to understand. See, if there is an independent business, for example, I have started this company called as Wisdom Hatch. And if I do a wonderful job and if I'm able to educate every single person about finance and in that process, I become a multi-billionaire, there is nothing wrong. Why? Because this is a private business that I've started. I'm not taking anyone's money. I'm not burning anyone's money. I'm not taking public's money. This is entirely a private business. But on the flip side, what majority of these infrastructure driven monopolies, for example, Tata is also an infrastructure driven monopoly and Adani's are also an infrastructure driven monopolies. What do they typically do? Okay, so this is how the flow works and they end up procuring a lot of debt from banks. For example, recently Bank of Baroda made the announcement that they are going to lend more money to the Adani group. Similarly, LIC, it is not a bank, but again, it is funded by public money. So all these institutes give one form of debt or the other to these big monopolies. So how are they getting their money? 
to go and build airports, go and build ports. How are they doing it? Well, by procuring public money one way or the other. Then what happens? They end up creating a monopoly. Now, then you need to take a look at the most important step that, hey, when this entire monopoly is created, two things are going to happen. Either that company is going to win, it is going to become really big. Who benefits in that case? In Tata's case, they end up giving majority of it to charity and you make the same analysis for the Adani group. But in the event these businesses fail, then what happens? Well, then we go to step one, that it is the public that will end up footing the bill for their failure. How exactly? I'll explain that subsequently. But I hope you got this complex financial story as to what is a responsible monopoly versus irresponsible monopoly. Now coming back to the initial graph that I had shown you, that hey, in the event that Tata Group's business fail or the likely failure of Tata Group's business, what is the probability of that? It is fairly low. Why? Because again, take a look at that number that their debt payment cycle is fairly small. It has been designed or managed in such a way. On the flip side, take a look at the debt repayment capacity of the Adani group. How soon they can liquidate their assets and pay back? All these things need to be considered. So that is the viewpoint that is entirely data driven. Please form your own opinions. You don't need to trust my words on it. Just simply look at publicly available data. So then comes the natural question that from time to time, different governments Governments. I'm saying governments, not government. So from time to time, different governments have partnered up with different business groups in order to give a part of publicly run businesses and convert them into private businesses, so to say, via the PPP or public private partnership model. There is nothing wrong with it. Again, as long as it is being done responsibly, it is completely fine. If the group is sensible, if the group has good intent, all those are good things, nothing wrong with it. But see, you need to understand the pace at which this game is being played. Think about it this way that if you are giving public's money to some private business and asking them to create ports, airports, etc. And if they ask that, you know what, give us like 10,000 crore of money or 20,000, 50,000 crore of money. Next year, again, give us 50,000 more crore of money. We will create like more airports. This is just too fast an expansion. So please keep that in mind. And just for context, let us pick the case study for airports just to show how irresponsibly this has been done. There are eight public private partnership run airports in India. Seven of them have gone to Adani. You tell me whether this is being done sensibly or not. Now I will not speak more otherwise this issue becomes political but I hope you are able to draw your own inferences out of it. Now you might have a natural response that why this airport thing is being blown out of proportion everyone is talking about it. Why is that the case? So let us pick case study of another country how their airports is run. So here is the American case study and there only one airport is such which is not run by their local or central government all else is government controlled. So that is a simple point there they are not privatized it. Of course we can get into it entire debate that in the US a lot of businesses are privately run for example healthcare companies I get it but here I'm just picking the case study of airports because the Indian airport business is going to become one of the most lucrative businesses going forward in the world in terms of domestic traffic that we are getting in terms of the wealth growth that is happening in India so this needs to be looked further into so now comes the final piece of the puzzle as to how this entire mechanism is played out well it is done by the banks and recently I was surprised to read the commentary of CEO MD of Bank of Baroda who literally said that we will continue to lend money to the Adani group as long as they meet our underwriting standards. Now you'll say okay what is wrong with this they will continue to lend to a particular business Okay, he went on to add that I do not bother about the stock market volatility. Well, you should bother because Bank of Baroda is not a private bank and you're not lending your own money. You are lending public's money. And if some company whom you have lent money to, it is going through an uncertain period, then you have to hold on. You can't give public statements like that. You know what? We will continue to lend them. Now you might say that Akshat, you have some hidden agenda. Do you know more about banking than MD CEOs? No, I do not. But here is the track record that I can see that over the last 10 years, this is the amount of public money that Bank of Baroda has lost. So when they talk about their underwriting standards, please take it with a grain of salt. And I, as a common citizen, has every right to ask these type of questions. It does not make me biased. It just simply makes me logical. A person who takes a look at data and asks relevant questions. And that is the same approach I would encourage you to understand. Now, given how complicated the finance world is, the lending space is, 
all this is given a nationalistic color right now for example akshat is against indians getting loans from indian banks no that is not the point that is the reason why i brought the example of tatas i am not against businesses getting loans but you please need to understand the difference between responsible and irresponsible monopolies whether we require them in the first place if they are being financed by banks with poor track record and there is brazenness associated with the fact that we'll continue to lend however we want it our underwriting standards are strong but our track record shows otherwise that is just plain wrong so point number 1 is that banks should support private groups there is no harm in that but they should support responsible lending that is a simple message that i'll leave you with point number 2 monopolies should be built when required we do not probably require monopolies in every sector every space of the domain just because private sector is better every time a monopoly is built few years down the line the geo example plays out that they will continue to raise prices do whatever you like i can guarantee you that whatever your mobile bill is today in 2023 you are going to pay 2x of that by 2028 third and very important point is that please do not confuse nationalism with a private business that benefits a specific family those two are very very different thing if some indian company is doing an amazing job we should all laud that effort no doubt about that but that does not give them a leeway to keep things unclear then comes the fourth point that the public money needs to be spent responsibly we should not have problems like like you know what banks are just lending that banks are not even able to recover 25% of their bad loans well it is very easy for me to shut up and not speak about these topics but i took a stand i hope that you would support me why because of the simple fact that back when vijay malya nirav modi took loans ran away and now vijay malya actually sits on his twitter on every bank holiday tweets about and mocks indian citizens that was irresponsible capitalism and i hope that people do not lose their sense of what is real and what is not and preserve their sense of data analysis and taking decisions using their brain because god has given all of us our brain please look at facts independently and please reach a conclusion and please do not associate everything with nationalistic pride hope you enjoyed this video please press the thumbs up and i'll see you soon